Luke Thompson needs no introduction. He is the host of one of the most popular and best loved podcasts for English learners in the world, Luke's English Podcast. And if you are already a dedicated listener to his show, you may know that he lives in Paris, in France. So in this episode, we are not going to talk about teaching English or even podcasts. Instead, we will talk about his experience living and working in Paris and the French. We'll talk about French waiters, French etiquettes. We'll talk about buying bread in France. We'll talk about driving in France. We'll talk about the French sense of humour. And we'll share some experiences that we've both had of living and working in France. So I hope you will enjoy this long and winding conversation with the one and only Luke Thompson. Hello there, Luke. Hello, Alistair. Uh, very nice to be here. How are you today? I am wonderful. It is an absolute honour for you to be here. Um, I told you just before we turned on the camera that I was going to give you a little bit of a an introduction. Uh, so viewers, I'm sure 99% of you will know who Luke is. I imagine that many of you are listeners to Luke's English podcast already. But just for the 1% who, who aren't, I wanted just to start by saying uh, on the 12th of April 2009, something wonderful happened. Uh, <laughs> and that was actually the first episode of Luke's English podcast uh, almost 15 years ago. And just before this started, just before uh, Luke and I got talking, I tried to calculate the total duration of Luke's English podcast. Uh, it turns out that after 860 episodes, I couldn't find a way to actually calculate it properly. But uh, it seems like uh, it seems like there's an average of about a hundred minutes per episode. Seriously, which, yeah. Uh, Luke obviously knows this much, much better than I do, but some are, you know, even more than two hours. Others are slightly slightly shorter. Um, but if you were to try and listen to all of Luke's English podcast, let's say you are in that 1% of people who have never ever listened to Luke's English podcast and you thought, right, I'm going to binge it. I'm going to listen to the whole thing from, from now. Uh, it would take you 63 days of continuous listening. Wow. 63 days. Goodness that's a me. Long time. And that's only, that's just, just pure listening where there's no that gap. Pure listening. Yeah. That's no toilet breaks, no uh, sleeping, no nothing. I don't recommend so, that, by the way, listeners, if you are in that 1%, you know, don't forget, you still have to eat, sleep, uh, you know, go to the toilet, all those things. Um, <clears throat> but that's the that's the wonder of podcasts, isn't it, that you can just put the podcast on, and you can then go about your, your daily business doing whatever it is you need to do, whatever sort of, you know, showering, um, urinating, whatever it may be, you know, you can do that with the with the podcast, just have the Bluetooth headphones on or whatever, not in the shower, I don't recommend that unless they are those special uh, waterproof ones that you can swim with. But anyway, wow, that's yeah, okay, sixty three days of of pure podcasting in total. That's you know what? That's not including all the premium stuff as well, because there's getting on for about two hundred premium episodes now. They're usually a bit shorter, but I'd say probably forty five minutes on average. So if we, I don't know what that is. You can add another another couple of weeks. <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's quite a long time. Uh, yeah. So so the 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 point is. In my calculation, I think, was probably slightly, slightly off. Um, it's, maybe it's more, maybe it's slightly less. But anyway, Luke is the uh, the the goat of of podcasting, and I'm absolutely honoured to have him on today. But Luke and I are not going to talk about um, English language podcasting today. We are going to be talking about the French. Now, this is something that I think lots of English people like to talk about. France and England, France and the UK are, um, let's say, frenemies, perhaps, um, <laughs> mm. friends mm. and enemies, and have a a long history of fighting each other, perhaps. Killing um, each other, yeah. trying their best. Killing each to, other. To, yeah. Mm. Um, but people in the UK have got a great affection for France, and perhaps I might be so bold as to say that the feeling is sometimes sometimes mutual. And 
I thought it would be a really interesting topic for a conversation with Luke because Luke lives in Paris and uh, is an expert on all things French. Can I say that? Perhaps I can say well, that. Well, I mean, I live here and so, and I'm married to a French girl. And so I don't know if I'm an expert, but certainly it's, you know, I just live it day in, day out. And I have done for over 10 years now. So, you know, in terms of my personal experience, uh, you know, I can just speak from that point of view. But I'm not an expert, so I, sh I probably should say that I'm not sort of like a cult. I'm not, I haven't done like master's degrees in French culture and and all that sort of thing. And I'm not even that well versed in French history. I've got a friend Amber, who's a regular guest on my podcast. She knows everything about French history. I probably should have invited her to be honest, because she <laughs> she has tons of insights as well. It's very interesting to hear her talking about it. But I'm not an in, uh, an expert in French uh, history um, and. Um, things like that. But I observe France and French culture. I experience it on a daily basis. And yeah, I'm an outsider. I still consider myself to be an outsider. I'm not French yet. I haven't got French um, citizenship, although everyone keeps telling me that I should be doing it. Um, but I have, I have, um, I mean, since Brexit, things are a bit complicated. <clears throat> so I, I had to apply for a, um, a kind of a, a 10 year working visa kind of thing. So I've got that. So I'm, they're not going to chuck me out of the country just yet. Um, but yeah, so I'm not an expert, but I, I can talk from my personal experience about living here. And also, I should say, probably for your for your listeners, um, I just want them to perhaps make a note of the way in which I talk about uh, France, the French, or maybe I should say Paris and the Parisians, because they're slightly different. We, we might come on to that. But I just want your listeners to notice perhaps the way I talk about it, because what I don't want to do is make any broad sweeping generalizations about France, because, you know, it's a, it's a diverse place. And, um, you know, there are all sorts of differences between people here. You know, I can't just say all French people are like this, French do this and that and so on. So I'll probably end up using certain kind of language to, um, you know, what's the word for it, uh, to, to avoid using generalization. So I'll say probably things like Parisians tend to do this, they can do that. Sometimes I've noticed that, you know, those sorts of little bits of hedging language are actually really, really useful and important, I think, when talking about um, like nationalities, uh, stereotypes and the realities and, and all that stuff. So. I'm going to try to avoid be making sweeping generalizations, and that will probably involve using certain bits of language to be a bit indirect and, and so on. Yeah. That is a, a good caveat. And I'll also add my own personal caveat in that I absolutely love, uh, well, here's a generalization. I love France. I have spent lots of time in France. I studied French at university. I went to French university as well. And I have a French, I've got a French godson even. So I have got a huge amount of time and admiration for all things French, but it is still fun to talk about some kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's like a friend that you, that you can have a bit of fun talking about and, um, uh, and kind of enjoy, uh, enjoy observing them from a distance and perhaps pointing out some peculiarities about, uh, about them. So, Oh. I, was good, I was just going to say, it's very interesting that you mentioned that your affection for France. Obviously, I have the same thing because, you know, I'm, I'm married to a, a French girl. I live here. My kids are, you know, both French and English. Um, and it's in these sorts of conversations where you get like a couple of foreigners, whether they're Americans or Brits or whatever, talking about France and French culture. Uh, there, there can be a tendency to go into this thing, which in France is called French bashing. Have you heard about French bashing? Um, I, I mean, I can, I can guess what it means, but I haven't heard the particular term. It's, it's kind of, in a way, it's interesting that there is such a thing as French bashing. It's kind of a well-known thing. It's basically criticizing France and just, you know, having a go and just criticizing, being, complaining and criticizing France. Anyone can do that, including the French, by the way. Uh, but, um, so yeah, we don't want to just indulge in some French bashing. We also want to talk about the, the things that we love about France as well, I suppose. Um, but really, yeah, it's about cultural differences, I think, this this conversation and expectations versus, rea versus reality and, and so on. Yeah. Sorry. Indeed. So, Luke, can, can we start just by me asking you, what brought you to France? And kind of how has your, how has your experience developed since then? 
So the, 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 in fact, the only reason, pretty much <laughs> the only reason I came here is because of my wife, who, when I moved here, was my girlfriend. So uh, she, as I've said several times now, she is French. And um, so we met in London and she was living in London. I'm basically going to tell the story of my of how I got together with my girlfriend now. Um, but it does explain how, you know, how I came here and stuff. Uh, so we met in London, she would just finished doing a master's degree and doing sort of further education and stuff. She'd worked really hard in Paris. And she took a couple of months off and came to London. Um, and sort of, uh, in, you know, worked on her English and just, in, you know, enjoyed being in a different place. And two weeks before she was due to go back home. Uh, I met her, we met each other. And uh, basically, it was like a Saturday in February. And I was at home looking forward to just to having a night in playing Red Dead Redemption on my PlayStation. And my cousin called me and he said, come out. Um, we're having an anti Valentine's uh, dinner, because it was the it was like the 13th of February. And uh, and I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I can't be bothered. I'm going to stay in. And he's like, no, there'll be girls. And I was like, oh, all right, then. And so basically his, um, his friend's girlfriend's friend, uh, brought my, my, you know, future wife with her. So basically I sat next to, almost sat next to her. I, it was her friend and then her at this restaurant table. And, um, we just kind of got talking and, um, hit it off and then started seeing each other and just for two weeks. And then she left and then we embarked on a long distance relationship, not that long distance, because obviously it's just the English channel. Uh, but every every other weekend, basically, either she came to London or I went to, to Paris and we carried on like that, um, spending a lot of money on Eurostar tickets uh, until <clears throat> I mean, she she loves London. She's a bit of an Anglophile. She loves England and British things. And uh, she wanted to actually move to London permanently. And she got a. Uh, she got down to like the final two in a job interview situation and didn't get the job. And she was like really upset. And so I was like, right, okay, it's time for me to step up to the plate. And right, I thought, right, okay, I'll come on then. I'll move to Paris because as an English teacher, that's an option. You know, you can move to different places relatively simply and, and find work. So I was like, right, okay, I'll do it. I'll I'll make the move. And so I moved to Paris and, you know, I'm still here. Um, so that's really the reason, um, I moved for the girl and then to an extent had to live with the city because, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've got a, a funny relationship with Paris, but I think to be honest, a lot of Parisians do too. It's a, it's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place, but it's also quite a complicated place. It can be a little bit tricky and a bit frustrating. Um, but you know, it's got its ups and downs. Perhaps we can go into some of those things during this conversation. Yeah. So when you first got to, got, I, I assume you've been to Paris before at some stage. Well, before I'd met her, I'd never been to Paris, but I had ah, spent okay. time in France, you know, like, like a lot of English families. We used to go to France on holiday down to the southwest of France and sometimes in Normandy. Uh, we'd have summer holidays um, there but never Paris, actually. Um, so my first experiences of Paris were when my uh, I came to visit my girlfriend for the first time, and she kind of showed me around. Yeah. And it, was she uh, is she from Paris or she's from somewhere else in France? She's yeah, she's one of those rare creatures, an uh, actual yeah. Paris. She's Parisian actual born and Parisian. bred several generations of, of uh, in fact, like on one side of her family, they go back generations and generations. So she is like fully Parisian. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, and so I'm kind of picturing you 10, 10 years ago or so, is that right? More or less. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Arriving in Paris, I guess, with certain expectations about what life might be like, uh, I guess, you, you know, you say you'd visited on weekends and you know, weekends are always different from thinking that you're actually, you know, now Paris is, is home. That's where you live. Mm. Um, and I, I'm always interested to kind of hear people's ex experiences of, you know, their expectations of a city versus the reality of it. And I, yeah. I know that Paris is perhaps particularly, uh, is a particularly interesting example, because I think almost any, anyone anywhere in the world, whether this is someone, you know, watching this in 
in you know Tokyo or New York or Madrid or wherever it might be, you probably you know you have some expectation about what Paris might be like because you've seen films, you've, you know, see people on social media posting about Paris. You know, we sort of have this idea of what life in Paris might be like, which I imagine you had a certain idea before actually moving there. Um, what was your, I mean, what was your thought about what Parisian life would be like and how does that compare to the reality, both when you first moved there and the reality now as a kind of 10 year veteran of of life in Paris? You know, funnily enough, funnily enough, I didn't really have many expectations because I was never really a kind of, you know, some people just love Paris, love the idea of it. Uh, they love the, the myth of Paris. And um, so they, it's, it's like, for a lot of people, it's like their dream to go to Paris and to live in Paris. It really is. But I never had that sort of, I never really had that dream and so I didn't have many expectations when I came. I'd never really seen a lot of those French films. I mean, I saw Amélie. Um, and uh, I mean, I talk about this in, in stand-up. We're going to probably talk about that a bit as well, that I do stand-up comedy in English in Paris. And so naturally, I end up talking about a lot of these things that we're talking about now. Um, I do talk about the sort of Hollywood versions of Paris and the different versions that you see in films. A lot of the time, it's the same kind of vision of Paris that's presented in the movies. Um, and there are like Dix, uh, Disney Disney animations, not Ratatouille, I mean, older ones. Like I think Lady and the Tramp is set in Paris um, mm. and is uh, some other ones. Uh, but I, I didn't really have, I hadn't really seen a lot of those films at that time. So I didn't really have a, a huge expectation. You know, I wasn't like a, a sort of American tourist um, who'd seen Emily in Paris and they decided that they wanted to come or a, or a tourist who'd, who'd watched Midnight in Paris, the Woody Allen film, and sort of, you know, had certain expectations. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. But nevertheless, I suppose somewhere in my mind, there was a version of the city and the, the, the stereotypes, the cliches, cliched images of Paris are that it's always springtime, that there are flowers everywhere, that um, sort of uh, people are very fashionable and um, uh, there's a certain kind of literary artistic culture here. Um, people sort of wander down the streets engaging in conversations. They sit at cafes having philosophical discussions. Um, people smoke all the time and... Um, there's always an accordion playing somewhere and it's very artistic and sort of uh, uh, kind of carefree and um, like the, the the sort of the cradle of, of uh, um, um, free thinking um, intellectualism and stuff like that, right? Um, and it, it wasn't exactly like that. <laughs> Not really. Uh, the, 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 in reality, Paris is a... Uh, although in to an extent it is all of those things I just mentioned... Um, but also it's, it's pretty, it's pretty grotty. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it can be quite dirty in some places. It can be quite grim. Uh, the weather is not always sunny and it's not the spring. Surprisingly enough, it's not springtime all year round. Like today, for example, it's gray, it's raining, it's cold. I mean, this is English weather. Uh, right. I mean, in, in England, you know, the, the stereotype of English weather is that it, it's grey and raining all the time. But the weather is almost exactly the same in Paris. And in fact, mm. I've I love telling French people this, that statistically Paris gets more rainfall uh, every year than than London does. Actually, more rain falls. I think it's just because the rain really? is heavier here, but um there and more rain falls in Paris every year than it does in London, so it can be grey and grim and depressing and rainy and and it's extremely crowded. People can be quite unhelpful. Um, there's a people are I have to say they can be a bit rude and Parisians will all agree with me. Um, I, I as well as doing stand up here, I teach English here and I have groups of of Parisians in my classes and you know, people who aren't from Paris too coming. And we often end up talking about these things at the beginning of a lesson. I'll say, how was your journey to school today? And then, and everyone's like, oh, la la. And then they go on about how horrible it was either driving um, or taking the metro and how, you know, people complain about Par Parisians complain about Paris all the time. And you, you, you can tell when someone is uh, a tourist 
when you ask them, oh, so what do you think of Paris? And they go, oh, it's fantastic. It's great. Uh, Parisians normally will just kind of be a bit more cynical about the place. Um, yeah, so we can get into more specifics if you want. Uh, but the yeah, the reality is, is um, yeah, it's not the same as in the movies. Um, mm -hmm. I saw the, the other day I saw, I, I think it was, a, I don't know, a, a, a clip from TikTok or something. I think there was an um, American tourist in uh, who kind of was doing a thing around Paris. Seen and it. She'd kind of, yeah, the, put the beret on and talked about how the French people, it was like, just like not, not like in the movies. And I sort of thought, you know, the French have got no obligation to just kind of constantly live up to a presentation of their, of their country and their city like a film. It's a, you know, it's a living, breathing city. Paris has got however many million people and to expect everyone to be sitting around in cafe, cafes kind of waiting to discuss like Sartre with you or something. It's, it doesn't quite work that way. Yeah. I mean, like the, 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 the main, let's say, victims of this um, false expectation. I mean, really, they should know better, really, because they do have a ridiculously unreal vision of what this city is going to be like. And yeah, the, 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 the ones who often get stung by this are those American tourists, like the girl in the TikTok video that you mentioned, and I've seen that as well. And she's walking yeah. along the, the banks of the River Seine on her own with a pink beret on, yeah. Um, kind of just really disappointed with her experience because, as you say, uh, you know, no one's like no one really cares. You know, like n they're not in the movie Midnight in Paris, this Woody Allen film. This this guy, this American writer who's who's not doing very well in his career, comes to Paris and sort of he's a bit depressed because his wife, his girlfriend's leaving him or something, and he sits in a cafe and mm. or he just sits on some steps. And Paris just like opens itself up to him and, and brings him in. And it's like these, all these artists and writers just emerge from down the street and they just whip, carry him up. And then he's in a cafe having intellectual discussions with these artists and he becomes the writer that he always wanted to become. This is like the, the, the what so many Americans in particular, I don't know why exactly it's, it's often Americans, this is what they often imagine that the place will be. It's this sort of, this sort of Arcadia of intellectualism. Um, it's very interesting that, especially Americans. I think that um, Americans have got a certain relationship with France, or at least a certain vision of France, which is probably quite interesting to explore. It may be something to do with the history. It may be what France represents. There is a myth of Paris that is in the minds of so many American people. I think it probably comes from stuff like, you know, the, the, the Revolutionary War, right? The War of Independence, because in that war, France played a key role in helping America achieve its, achieve its independence. Because as we said before, France and England have, have been enemies on and off over the years. And at that time, uh, England and France were certainly enemies. And so it was in France's interests to, to support American independence against um, you know, British colonialism and, and power. And so France helped America achieve its independence. And America, I think, took a lot of inspiration from French um, republicanism, you know, and, and its democracy and its, its sort of, um, you know, its, its, its ideology, you know, which is that it's this, this democratic place. Um, so I think that might be something to do with it, that I think for some Americans, France is the essence of what it is to be a republic and what it is to be free from, um, you know, um, imperial rule. And so that feeds into it as well. But also then there's the, the myth of the American writers and artists who go to Paris to achieve a sort of um, artistic independence and freedom. And you've got F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway and and people like that who are in that uh, Midnight in Paris uh, Woody Allen film. You know, they they turn mm -hmm. up in the film. Um, so that is again is part of the myth that it's a not only a, a, somehow a crucial sort of ligament to American uh, independence and freedom somehow, uh, but it's also um, a kind of uh, uh, yeah, a, a place where Americans can go to be 
deep and intellectual and learn to become become writers existentialism as well you know existentialist philosophy which also feeds into a lot of american stuff you know like american uh, the se- move, movies from the 70s the american beat movement um mm. you could argue that a lot of that has its roots in in french culture uh, French cinema, new wave, French new wave cinema, which was so influential on American sort of the American um, new Hollywood movement of the seventies, um, and the yeah the beatniks in America who kind of like kicked off that alternative culture, which became sort of like the hippie movement and stuff. Arguably, a lot of that is based on sort of French um, uh, existentialism and stuff like that. But then, on a day to day to day basis, you just go to a cafe and with your beret on. And you just get ignored yeah. by an unfriendly waiter yeah. who serves you a bad coffee and then ignores you. You know, it's that's actually what it's like. And then you go outside and it's not very the weather's not very nice. And there are crowds of people who might bump into you and you decide to take the metro. And when you get on the you try to get on the metro and everyone's pushing you out of the way. Like literally you get pushed. Mm. And the metro is kind of a bit disgusting. And there's like a weird smell. You know, like, what is that smell? And then, you know, you notice there are like way more homeless people everywhere than you realize that because no one ever shows that or talks about that, like the homelessness and um, and the fact that, you know, there, there are quite a lot of dodgy people in the street. It's, you know, it's a, it's a major city just like everywhere. So there's going to be crime and areas that are less nice. And then you go to the nice areas and people just... It can be a bit of a bad vibe. I don't know how else to put it, really. But sometimes it's just a bit of a, a vibe of like, oh, I'm not, I don't really feel that people are that friendly. No one seems to care. Um, mm. That's a bit disappointing. So you end up with that American girl walking along the on the banks of the river, all disappointed. And the, in her pink beret, the, literally the only people I ever see in Paris wearing a beret are American tourists. And you can see them yeah. a mile away. There are these little shops that sell berets, like pink ones, red ones, black ones, or whatever. And you, there's so many times that I just see groups of tourists and there's always, the girls have always got berets on. I'm like, you know, the, the tourists are the only ones who wear those. Um, mm. Yeah. But then having said that, it's still a fantastic place to visit because you've got every court every street at the end of every street there's an amazing building amazing architecture it's beautiful and the bread is delicious yeah i i guess the the sort of stereotypical view is a little bit like people coming to london and expecting they can just sort of turn up in notting hill and sort of knock on a door and then someone says come on in we're having a party and and that entire place is full of uh, you know, people working in in small bookstores and living in what would now be kind of multi million pound houses, um, and then the, you go and you see the reality, and that's yeah, it, it's not the same. It's yeah. a varied city. There's lots of different aspects to it, and people are you know, it, it's not it's not a movie set. People are living their lives, and they don't really they're not so bothered about you and and what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And but added to that, there's an also extra thing, which is that Parisians can be a little bit self involved, and not that considerate. I mean, you know, fair enough, they're just living their lives. It's not it's not for them to be considered, you know, that's it's just a different culture. But um, so not only is it slightly less than what you expected, it's even further than that, in the to the extent that Parisians, to be frank, can be a bit rude. Uh, you know but it's also a slightly different um the codes the cultural codes are different so whereas fair enough parisians can be a bit rude and self-oriented but also a lot of the time these things that tourists experience are as a result of them getting something wrong culturally so this is part of the misunderstanding as well that people complain that Parisians are rude, that waiters are rude, that customer service situations, people are being rude. But often tourists don't realize that they're actually being rude first. Um, So typically what happens is people come in and they just speak English straight away, which is kind of, first of all, a little bit presumptuous because, you know, you're in France, you know, you you should at least try and speak French. Um, And then there are also cultural codes here, which, which are very clear and if you don't, um, if you don't follow those codes, then you're you're essentially being rude. Um, 
fair enough like tourists Example. don't know don't know what those codes are you know but every french person knows them so basic example if you go into a if you go into a cafe and you speak to a waiter and you want to say can i sit here you can't just go in and say je you know je peux you know i can't you just can't say i can i sit here you have to say bonjour first right you have to say bonjour or bonsoir first mm. and it's yeah. really simple but really important because if you don't do that then you're just being rude you know it's very easy to be rude here but it's also very easy to be polite as well you know and that includes just if you're in a supermarket and you want to ask where the i don't know where if they sell plasters you know where can i find plasters you have to say bonjour first mm. and even if you then speak english that's okay but if you said bonjour first bonjour do you sell plasters you know and then they'll be like uh you know because they don't know what plasters means but mm. at least you've made the right step you know you've kicked things off in the right way by saying bonjour and when you walk into a shop you know or when you leave the shop merci bonjour you have to say bonjour or bonsoir and then when you leave you have to say bonjour bonsoir and that's like basic and if you get that wrong then i'm afraid you've been rude first without even realizing it that is a that is a, a good tip for anyone thinking of uh, going to france is there is there a kind of are there any of those cultural nuances like strange cultural codes that you think are very unusual from the perspective of a of a brit yeah i think that there's there is a um so certain that the value system is slightly different so in the uk we and I, again i'm not an expert this is just kind of what i've worked out for myself so first of all we've got a different relationship to work and everything that involves um and also i think that british people and american people tend to be a bit more pragmatic in the way that they do things whereas i feel like in france and maybe i need to just talk about paris because paris and france are different but anyway in in france things are led a bit more by principle mm -hmm. so um it's difficult to explain that one i need to think of some examples but let's go back to the subjects of work so again you're you're approaching uh someone to ask them a question like you're you're approaching the waiter or the bus driver or something like that you've got to remember that um how do i put it <laughs> in a way in a way uh asking someone to do some work is like a violation of their human rights in this country and you've always got to be aware of that right work in the uk work is like a matter of pride and you know we we take a sort of pride in in our work in a way that we're defined by our work you know we're mm. pragmatic sort of work oriented culture especially america um you know and i think america and britain do share quite a lot of things you know certain anglo saxon sort of thing or whatever um whereas in france the person that you're talking to is an individual living their life that's the really important principle that they are trying to live their life trying to have a good life and that work is just a thing that they have to do to achieve that so if you go up mm. to someone and ask them a question you are kind of imposing work on them and not necessarily respecting them as a human being first and foremost and that sounds a little bit ridiculous when i say it but actually when you apply that to things on a daily basis you realize that that's actually kind of what's going on and and, and you know if you always go in with a certain level of humanity of a kind of the, the the attitude is like i don't know maybe i'm getting this wrong my wife might disagree with me on this but if you go in with a sort of like i'm sorry to kind of um trample on your human rights here but i just have a little request for you mm. um or or this or this you go in and you ask a question and let's say i don't know what what, what would the situation be you just go into a shop and you you, you we go to go up to a restaurant it's like 2 30 in the afternoon it's a bit late and you say do you have a table and they say oh no c'est pas possible you know that's you often get that no sorry it's not possible mm. so no yeah. is often the first point of contact is uh, non c'est difficile uh, franchement c'est pas possible like sorry it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult no it's not possible yeah. now what what i would do 
as a Brit is I'd be like, oh, all right, never mind. Thanks very much. Sorry to bother you. Um, but what you have to do is you have to stand there and go, yeah, okay, that's complicated. And you sort of say, hmm, is there really nothing you can do? Um, and you just kind of wait and understand, just understand that like essentially what the person is saying is like, okay, you're, you're asking me to do something difficult here. You know, and you have to be like, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. It's difficult, isn't it, having to do work? Yeah. <sighs> and then you kind of like try and get some complicity with them on a human level. And then eventually they'll kind of go, well, you know what? You know what? So, look, I'll see what I can do. And then then you might get yes. So like mm. no comes first. And then you need to just wait around a little bit and just kind of try and build up a little relationship with the person. And then eventually you'll get yes. And then they'll be really nice to you and, and you've made friends with them. And, and when you try and get their attention, they'll come to your table. But if you haven't built up that sense of complicity with them on a human level, <laughs> then they're not necessarily just going to automatically give you good service because, mm. because that's just a, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm like part, I'm like 70% of the way to understand, actually understanding this myself even. But I think there's something to what I've said. Yeah. So it's sort of saying, look, I, I know you were planning to have a nice sit down and and kind of not bring me lunch, but I'm hungry and I can't do anything about it. And look, I know it's an inconvenience to you, but please, can I have a table? Yeah, and just sort of like don't take no for an answer as well. Because mm. <laughs> no is always the first reaction. I don't know why. It's often... It's often like a mm, negative reaction. Whereas in the UK, often the first thing is like, you know, everything's like friendly and great and it's all positive. Um, and, you know, if you're from a different culture, you might be led to believe that, oh, this, you know, this is great. This person really, we're like best friends now, but then it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, whereas mm. in France, it can be difficult at first. You have to break through that sort of barrier of, I don't know what it is really. But just eventually, once you've got through that, then you can actually get something done. Um, yeah, I don't really know why that is. But I, I think, uh, again, something to, something, to do with, something to do with the principle in the culture, which is that, you know, yeah, that, that uh, people are not defined by their work. Yeah. Which hmm. I guess is something that, that lots of, but in my opinion, lots of cultures could take something something from in terms of, you know, this person has, is a human being and they are, um, you know, they have their own hopes and dreams. That are, the hopes and dreams don't just involve serving you lunch or driving your bus somewhere or things like that. So yeah. it's sort of, I guess that's kind of a nice thing. Well, often their hopes and dreams are just to kind of like just relax and enjoy their day and have a cigarette and drink a coffee, you know, and not be bothered yeah. by some other person who's like you know, asking them to do something. Um, but it also relates, I think, to, to you know, that relates to other situations, not just customer service situations, but I think probably like meetings, you know, in uh, French companies. My French students often tell me about the way that meetings go here and that it, they express frustration about the fact that meetings go on for ages and it takes forever to get a decision and every single person at the meeting has to give their opinion you know, like, a, a, I think maybe a, an English a meeting in the UK is going to be a bit more pragmatic. It's going to be like, right, let's just crack on and just get, mm. you know, like get this thing achieved. And that's the aim. You know, it's, there's a purpose for it. Whereas in France, you have to take a lot more time and you have to listen to what everyone has to say, you know. And so it can be a bit frustrating because it just takes ages. You know, everything just takes ages. There's, it seems to me there's always a lot more discussion going on. Everyone giving their opinion. Everyone's opinion has to be heard. Um, and um, and then you start to wonder, what is that? Is that actually the, what's the, the most, what's the priority here? That everyone just gets to say what they have to say or that we actually achieve something at the end of this meeting? Um, but that's, you know, that's not to say that the same thing doesn't happen in the UK sometimes, you know, but I think it's fair to say that is a common complaint uh, uh, of French people themselves about uh, business culture here, that 
everything seems to take a long time. There's always some complicated factor that has to be respected. Also, bureaucracy as well. There's like so much more bureaucracy, so much paperwork. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, uh, it's interesting hearing you talk about, you know, that everyone needs to be heard and everyone needs to be kind of feeling like they have had their had their say. Is that because in your experience, France is a less hierarchical place than the UK? Like French working culture is less hierarchical or is it due to something else, do you think? I'm not sure really about the hierarchical thing. I think maybe it's, you know, a general principle in French society, that sense of equality and democracy that everyone is the same. Everyone, Yeah, maybe that's hierarchy. I don't know if it's hierarchy in a business structure, perhaps, but certainly in society. There's a very important principle is that, you know, no one's above anyone else. Although in reality, mm. that is definitely the case. I mean, there's an elitism here. There are people who definitely live in different stratas of society who have a lot more privilege and opportunity. These The people from these upper levels of society end up in the big positions, just like in the UK. Mm. Um, in But in the unlike in the UK, which arguably still has a class system, or the sort of the, the the remnants or the imprint of a class system on it. In France, officially, there is no distinction between people. Everyone is just French, and that's it. And so I think this, maybe this idea does permeate its way through French society, where like no one is above anyone else. And so mm. French people can get a little bit annoyed or upset if other people get an advantage that they don't have. And this even, I don't know if it's, I don't really understand the reasons why, but all I see is what happens. And this maybe accounts for things like queuing. So one of my personal like bugbears, the things that, one of the things that really does my head in here is queuing up. Because in the UK, we are, I don't know why, naturally, we just queue up really well. We're like really good at queuing. So if there's a situation, we'll just, an orderly queue will just automatically form. And the, mm. the queue behaves itself really well. For example, if there's a queue outside a bakery, which actually never happens, unless it's a Greg's maybe, I don't know, but if there's a queue outside a thing, the queue will go out of the door, it'll turn the corner and go up the street and there'll be space in the street still for people to walk up and down and everyone naturally forms a queue. They, there's like I don't know what it is, but I need to work out some mathematical formula, which is where you're supposed to stand in that queue. And it's it's like there's a line between the person you're standing in uh, behind and the person that person is standing behind. It makes a a clear line. Of, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and snake. you have to yeah you have to be on that axis. You know what I mean? So if 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 yeah. the person is turned. You also have to kind of turn so you're still on in the queue axis. You know, the central queue line has to be respected. This is like the intelligence of the queue. It has its own intelligence where, you know, every segment of the queue sort of locks in together and it, it ends up with this intelligence where it's able to turn corners, and deal with obstacles and stuff like that. In France, you get a similar situation and it would be outside of boulangerie, like at on Saturday at 10, 11 a.m. outside the boulangerie, there'll be a big queue. And the queue just doesn't seem to function in the same way. There's a lot more vagueness in the queue. So I will turn up to get my bread and I'm thinking, wait a minute, where is the back of the queue here? It's not entirely clear. And so you kind of stand where you think it is. And this happens to me so much. I'll I'll think with my British queue trained analyzing brain like this is clearly where the queue line axis is so i have to stand here and i stand there and then other people vaguely arrive sort of next to me a little bit and then a couple of steps later they've jumped ahead of me in the queue and i'm just like Grr! and i i can't say anything because i can't i don't i don't have the um sophistication in my french to be able to say i'm sorry but i think the queue was here and i think i was first and it's especially when it's contextually not even that clear. And mm. you know, you need them to understand to be on the same page. You know, if they're not on the same page, if in their minds it's like, well, it doesn't really matter, you know, there's it's you know, it's just it's not as clear cut as that. 
So if they're not on the same page as me and I start saying, oh, I think the queue was over here, and then I'm just an idiot. You know, I'm just a weirdo. And, you, and you'd, probably, you'd probably end up saying it in a very British way, like, mm, I, I think perhaps the end of the queue was back there, rather than saying, excuse me, mate, yeah. you, know, you jumped ahead of me. If I do it in a direct way, which would be the, the more French way of doing it, then I'd need to be super confident that I'm, that I'm right and also super confident that they understand what I'm saying. Because this is mm. this sort of thing happens to me all the time, where I, I might be like, right, okay, now I'm going to be direct and say, um, excuse me, I'm next in the queue. Je suis le prochain, en fait, you know, or whatever it is. Um, but then you've got to really commit to that, especially if the queue is long, because then you've got to stand in that queue next to those people for a good ten minutes, mm. and that could be yeah. seriously awkward. And most of the time, I'm just like, I'd, it's all right. I'll just, well, you know, if no one's looking, I'll just kind of like like some kind of pathetic loser, I'll just walk behind those people and just carry on with my life. Um, um, yeah, and so <laughs> I get queue jumped all the time. And it's normally as a result of some ambiguity in the queue, because the people don't respect the line of the queue. Again, the boulangerie, it, it, the queue comes out of the door and just spreads out into the pavement and into the road where people are just standing in the road and then cars are coming up the road and they're going beep, beep, beep. The drivers of the cars are getting all angry. And then the people standing in the queue are getting, oh, you know, everyone's getting upset and angry with each other. And I'm just there going, what on earth? You know, why is every, why can't people function in a queue properly? And, and everyone gets upset. Like they do get upset about it as a result. People get frustrated and they go about their day with this sense of injustice. That's a f another feeling I've noticed is that people kind of walk around like they've been wronged somehow. And <laughs> my theory is that like uh, the average Parisian will get up in the morning, everything's fine. It's like a nice sunny day, have a cup of coffee, everything's good, lovely day, great. They go outside, try to get on the metro and someone bumps into them. And that's that's the moment that they've been wronged and they kind of carry that with them for the rest of the day. Whereas in England, you do the same thing. You get, you're about to get on the on the underground, and someone else is getting off, and you go, "Oh, sorry," and they say, "Sorry to you, sorry, sorry," and then you just carry on because by saying sorry, you've kind of, um, what's the word for it? Both of you have basically said it's all right, no problem, which is what sorry yeah. often means. Uh, it it actually means uh, I'll take responsibility for that. Let's just forget about this and move on. No problem, no problem. Which is why when someone steps on your foot on the underground in London, automatically you say sorry, because you, mm. what you mean is like, it's all right. It's no problem. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> in, in Paris, if you step on someone's foot, they will, you know, they'll be annoyed with you and then you'll be annoyed with them because it was an accident. And then, oh, you know, there's a lot of that in Paris. <sighs> I just got this this vision of you kind of at like seven o'clock in the evening getting a call from your wife saying, "Luke, where's the, where's the bread? You've been gone for ten hours." <laughs> yeah, and we go. I'm trying. I'm trying I'm to trying. get the. Yeah, I'm trying my best, and it's just I've been jumped by 472 <laughs> Parisians who who've all been wronged by other people, and I'm really trying here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So really, you got to just like relax. Um, I don't know how Parisians do it. But I, I often see a lot of arguing, and I and but it's just like normal. It's just normal for them, it seems. Like driving in in Paris, people will just beep their horn at each other all the time. Mm. Now in England, if someone beeps their horn at you, it's like oh oh god, what did I do wrong? You know, it's like really serious. If you beep your horn, you know you've got to beep for a good reason. Whereas in in France, it's literally the light has changed from red to green. And the cars all just beep you from behind. It's like, I, give me a chance. You know how long it takes me to actually press my foot down and get into first gear? They're all beeping already. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's just, yeah, I don't know. I don't really understand like the logic. And, and when I ask French people about Frenchness, this is something I've been trying to work, at, work on in my stand-up, right? I talk to French people. I'm trying to understand French thinking and French uh, French mind, and French people say, "Well, you know, to understand the French, you have to you have to know that we are a rational people. It's a rational culture." I'm like, "Rational? No, you're not. <laughs> have you seen the way you drive? Because there's nothing mm. rational about um, 
you know, uh, there's nothing rational about the, the the roundabout at the Arc de Triomphe. You know, that is almost completely irrational system. I I, I was about to to ask about that because I remember my dad telling me once that he he seemed to think it had changed, but perhaps it hadn't. I remember him saying that the the law for that roundabout seemed to be that the priority was for people going on, so they would yeah. just be in his experience going there as a I don't know a twenty year old or something, just people kind of like accelerating onto the roundabout and then other people having to break to give way to them. Is yeah. that still the case? Absolutely. It's it's complete madness, right? And this is what I mean when I say the French, this is not rational at all. This is completely irrational, <laughs> this system. So the uh, uh, there's that junction and I think some other junctions, right, uh, which have... So normally a roundabout, and I hope your listeners understand what a roundabout is, a circular junction, right? Uh, normally with a roundabout, you give way to the cars which are already on the the roundabout. So um, let's see if if you're in uh, if you're in England, which way is it? I can't remember which way they go England, around. You're going clockwise in France. In England, going, the cars are going round clockwise. So you have to give way to the cars coming from your right. Yes, yeah. Yes. I drive in both places, so uh, sometimes I forget. But. Um, so you give way to, if there's a car coming around the roundabout, you give way, let them pass until there's a space, and then you enter the roundabout. Most roundabouts in, in France are the same, obviously, but going the other way around because they drive on the wrong side of the road. Um, and uh, But at the Arc de Triomphe, which is a huge roundabout, it's the, it's the opposite system. So the cars on the roundabout have to give way to the cars coming into the roundabout which when you think about it is madness. Surely this just means that that roundabout is going to get full really quickly. And it does. And it's often completely jammed up. And you'll be going around the roundabout innocently trying to survive to get to your exit. And suddenly, cars are racing towards you at a 90 degree angle. There's cars coming at your side. You know, you're just driving around. Suddenly, there's like BMWs and Peugeots coming at you from the side. And beeping at you because you're not giving way to them. Uh, so yeah, that seems just madness to me. Um, and there are no lines on that roundabout as well. No lines on the street, so it often gets into a crazy, a crazy traffic jam. Um, yeah, I could go on. I could talk more about driving, but um, I don't know if <laughs> if that, that's probably enough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you ever travel to to Malta then there will be you can probably find some competition for crazy drivers do, do, in Malta does do, do people jump uh, the lights uh, yeah, yeah lights are kind of optional uh, use of indicators very much frowned upon um, you can overtake anywhere um, plus also you have uh, so uh, in Malta people drive on the same side of the road as in the UK but there are lots of you know French tourists lots of spanish tourists lots of italians coming over from from sicily driving over and in those countries they drive on the different on the other side of the road and so it happens pretty frequently i just see people driving on the wrong side of the road you know in yeah. a in an urban environment which is clearly not a good idea yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. here in, um a common thing here in paris especially is that when you get junctions like a you know a, a, an old-fashioned like t-junction a cross junction where there are lights what happens is that so cars and it's often a traffic jam situation cars kind of it's green and all the cars are backed up and they crawl through the green light and at some point the light goes red but the so the, the let's say one car in front has gone through the green light and then it's gone red but the car right behind it's red for them but the driver mm. thinks, well, I'm just going to stick to the back of this car in front that's passed through the green light. And look, it's the same car. If I just stick <laughs> to the bumper, we're the same car. And then every car does that. They all just stick to the back of the car in front and think that, that's, that they can just cruise through the red light. And then what happens is the exit from that junction is blocked because everyone has gone through. And so those people get stranded in the middle of the junction. And obviously, then the cars coming across want mm. to come through, and they push through and push through and push through. And then you end up with a situation where it's total gridlock in the middle of this junction, because all the cars 
have just pushed through regardless of whether it's a red or green light and everyone's squashed up in the middle and then cars try, try and push round, get past each other, scooters start coming in and you end up with this total disaster where all these cars are all jammed up in, in different directions at 90 degree angles to each other and then they all start beeping and waving their hands and shouting and swearing at each other. Um, and it's just all you need to do is like someone has thought about this system very carefully. If the light is red, you stop. If the light is green, you go. And if you follow that system, then everything will be all right, you know. Yeah. But no, no, no. Everyone just tries to kind of break the rules in their own little way. And as a result, you end up with total chaos. Yeah. I, I imagine you have quite a lot of fun talking with your wife about these kind of peculiarities of France, life in France and the French. Um, are, are there some time, are there some things that you, you know, some of these kind of things that you mention, and I imagine some of them she kind of ag agrees with. Uh, she does, are yeah. There, are, are there other times where you, you kind of come up against a wall of, of Frenchness? And th the reason I ask that is because my wife is Italian and she is also able to, um, to kind of laugh about some peculiarities of Italy. But sometimes I come up against a wall of Italianness. Uh, and, I, and I also see the same thing when she makes jokes about Brits and and life in the UK that I feel sometimes my kind of guard gets up a little bit. I'm like, oh, oh. Yeah. But I'm not so sure about that. Anyway, question back to you. Do you, uh, d does she sort of see all those things and, uh, and be like, yes, that is ridiculous? Or there, are there a few things where there are kind of rational, rational responses. So for the most part, she actually agrees with everything I, with all my comments and observations and she agrees. So she'll say, bah, oui, uh, you know, les gens sont fous. Like people are mad, people are crazy. So this is the funny thing that when I talk to Parisians one on one, everyone agrees, you know, everyone completely agrees with it. But then somehow as a, as a, as a large group, everyone seems to continue to adopt the same behavior, thinking that it's only other people and not them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, you know, it's, it's really interesting from a human psychology point of view of like what it is that what happens when groups behave, you know, in a, in a, as a group and where responsibility and decision-making lies away from the individuals in that group, you know, it's, I find that fascinating. It probably accounts for, a lot of the things that we're talking about why uh, where you know accounts for like behavior in in cult within certain cultures and countries um but uh, i'm just trying to think of things that she doesn't really agree with me about where i point things out she doesn't really agree with me she seems to agree with me on most things which is fortunate considering i'm married to her um but um but yeah in terms of if we if we point if we turn our attention to the uk it's i bet it's the same kind of stuff that your your wife uh, comments on uh too so sh my wife will look at british culture and look at a sort of she'll often comment on a certain kind of ambiguous indirectness in our communication and from the point of view of direct cultures like i think probably mediterranean cultures are fairly direct in their communication um the brits can seem to be can seem to be very sort of wishy-washy mm. right in our communication and it's kind of like unclear what exactly is it that you think you know just just say what you think whereas brits we're always trying to kind of mediate and be polite in order to m make sure things go smoothly we're just trying to be nice and and keep things sweet right so we will add like little softeners to the things we say or we'll add a little spoonful of sugar uh with sugar coat things that we say um and and sometimes i mean actually to be fair as i said before my wife is a bit of an anglophile and she actually loves these things so when she does business with british people she's like oh i love it i love doing business with british people they're always so nice and friendly uh but then there are times when you know uh she she's sort of like she'll show me an email and she's like what does this person actually mean what do they think and i'll get straight to the bottom of it like an, mm. another another example which i've given before which is that so where my parents live uh, there's a big castle right and my wife always wants to visit the castle 
Uh, and my my parents are like they're not really interested in going to the castle. They just want just to sit around with us, have a cup of tea, and just like talk to us. And they don't want to go to the castle. But my wife's like, you know, well, let's go to the castle. So she'll email my parents and say, oh, um, you know, why don't we go to the castle uh, next week when we visit? And my dad will write back saying, yeah, we could go to the castle, uh, but, but, you know, we could go to the castle, but blah, 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 blah. And then, you mm. know, he'll mention some other thing that he actually wants to do. Um, Translation. And then my, I do not want to go to the castle. Yeah, yeah. My wife will then say to me, oh, fantastic. We're going to go to the castle. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Let me, let me read the email. And then I'll read it and I'll be like, we're not going to the castle. And she's like, what? And I said, yeah, it says we could go to the castle, but that that just that doesn't mean we're going to go to the castle that that means we're not going to go to the castle and so <laughs> uh um that kind of thing can kind of flummox her a little bit um but actually generally speaking fortunately she agrees with me on on a lot of my observations um mm. Mm. i'll give you one example of something that my wife likes to kind of make fun of uh, British people about, or it was yeah. certainly surprising to her when she was in the UK, is that this, um, in Italian culture, I, th I think it's probably a similar kind of thing in French culture, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, if, you know, you meet someone and you're, uh, or it's some kind of acquaintance, and they might say, oh, you, you know, you've got to come over for dinner. They might say, oh, when? You know, come up, like next Tuesday, let's do it. And that happened a few times in the UK with a few people. Oh, like, you, should, you should definitely come over for dinner. And my wife was like, oh, okay, yes, sure. How about next week? And we're like, uh, you know, <laughs> actually, that's not the way it works. That's, that's the kind of thing you say to be you know, polite, being like, oh, it's, you know, it's nice to meet you. There's a slim possibility that at some stage in the future, we might see each other again. But, you know, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so it's. It's that kind of indirectness, perhaps, and being polite, wanting to say something nice, but not necessarily wanting to follow it up with a, a, a kind of uh, something real. I, to be honest, I can totally understand how your wife feels about that, because actually, I, I think that is, I don't really like it when people do that, when they say, oh, yeah, you must come over for dinner. Or anytime, you know, ev if you ever come to London, you know, let me know and it will be great to meet up and I'll show you around. And, but they don't mean it. I actually don't like it when people do that. Just, you know, that just actually seems a little bit unnecessary to, so I understand that. Um, but yeah, yeah it's too. all about understanding cultural codes, isn't it? And just being able to read the language and uh, little things like that. You just know that that's just a, a, a polite thing to say. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think of other things. Yeah, maybe it'll come to me. I was going to mention, actually, um, if we go back to, um, like, people coming to Paris and, and having their expectations, um, uh, like, like, like um, ha not having their expectations met or being surprised, um, there is, I mentioned this to you before, there's a, a, a phenomenon called uh, Paris culture, uh, Paris syndrome, Paris syndrome. And you said to me that you'd never heard of Paris syndrome before. Right. I hadn't. No. Stockholm syndrome. Yes. Paris syndrome. No. Stockholm syndrome. Yes. Which is, you know, where people start to become friends. with their very yeah. Yeah. Maybe I've got Stockholm syndrome because I've been in, in, living in Paris now for 10 years. And I, you know, you just like, you've got no choice but to kind of fall in love with the place. Actually, and Paris, is a, Paris is a wonderful, I mean, it's a wonderful, I should say it's a wonderful place. I mean, you know, like I said before, I walk down the street. And so the, the, this is the thing about Paris. You got to you, you walk down the street, and you got to you got to make sure you always look up, because there are wonderful things to see, beautiful architecture. There are these housemanian buildings with these wonderful uh, balconies on them, and people have put flowers in their windows. And you know, you look up, and there are monuments at the end of streets and things like that. So there's that level, but you can't go around living your life up there because down here. There's a whole other challenge, which is you've got all the angry, frustrated Parisians walking down the street that you have to try and avoid. And then even further down, you've got their dogs as well. And then below them, there's like the dog poo, which those dogs have left on the street. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's, it, it, it enrages me. It really does. 
people will let their dogs poo in the worst spots, like in the cor- on a corner where like people are crossing the street or even in front of a post office or something. It's just unbelievable. Um, but anyway, so Paris syndrome, this is an actual phenomenon, right? Um, and it's a, a, a set of psychiatric symptoms that people can experience when they visit Paris. Um, and it's, it's a severe form of culture shock. Okay, um, the syndrome, this is according to Wikipedia, is characterized by symptoms such as acute delusional states. This is where someone is literally walking around in a kind of state of total delusion. Um, Hallucinations, feelings of persecution. So that's perceptions of being a victim of prejudice, aggression, hostility. So like a total sense of paranoia where you feel like everyone is against you or everyone's completely hostile to you, which actually might actually be the case. (laughs) Um, But um, uh, 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 anxiety, uh, psychosomatic manifestations such as dizziness, sweating, and even vomiting. Now, who do you think uh, suffers from Paris syndrome the most? Who is this most commonly associated with, do you think? Which, Which visitors? Uh, from a particular country, yeah, uh, I would Im- I would imagine Americans could be could be a good choice there. No, it's it's not actually most commonly associated with Americans. It's most commonly associated with Japanese tourists. So uh-huh. we we mentioned before that Americans have got this kind of like uh, idealized mm-hmm. version of Paris that they expect and then don't find. The Japanese arguably have got an even less realistic version vision of of what the city is like, and um, and actually the reality that they're met with is I in my experience like poles apart from what life is like in in Japan. So I lived in Japan for a couple of years, and I've lived in France in Paris now for a few years as well, and I think certain things are like completely different, totally different. Um, and you know, using the metro, the underground trains, as an example, in in Paris, in uh, in in Japan, you everything is very very. Everyone is very. Um, what's the word for it? Thoughtful of of others, and it's mm. all about making sure you don't uh, impose yourself on other people in any way, and that you minimise um, irritation or imposition on on your fellow travellers. And this includes the the physical space that you're using. So you're very aware of what's going on around you. You stand in specific places on the platform where there are lines. You queue up at these these specific designated spots. If you don't stand on those spots, then you are kind of breaking the rules and people will look at you like, why aren't you standing on these lines? The train comes in exactly on time. It lines up with the markings on the platform. The doors open, the people queuing at these lines, all, the whole line shifts to the side of the train to allow space for the other passengers to come off. All those passengers come off the train and go about their business. And then the two lines file into the train. Everyone like takes their places. People sit down, they hold their bag on their lap. They don't take up too much space. No one is like spreading their legs out and stuff. Everyone's sort of like... Uh, contains themselves quite closely and um everyone's quiet on on the train and um so that's just one idea then in paris you get the same thing you get onto the train platform there's a kind of a nondescript crowd of of people also that the trains in in japan are extremely clean often the floor is so shiny you can see your reflection in it you get into the paris metro as I said before, it's kind of a bit smelly and a bit grotty. Some of the Paris metro stations are wonderful. They've got these beautiful Art Deco designs and stuff. But then a lot of them, there's just like a dirty, weird sort of grotty atmosphere in there. I think it's because of the river, to be honest. I think it's the earth. It's the kind of the rock, the earth, the mud, uh, and the conditions create this kind of slightly grotty under under the ground feeling where you sometimes get like even slime coming down the wall and that's just because water is leaking down the wall you know from the mud next to the river there's just like a slime coming down the wall and because of these things you actually get everywhere in the in the paris metro there's a little gutter 
at the side. So you've got the, the, the train tracks, the platform, a little gutter, and then the wall. And the gutter runs through the entire system. And I'm fascinated by this gutter because there's always like some nondescript slimy liquid in these gutters. Oh. And when I first arrived, I just assumed it was urine, right? Because sometimes it smells like that. So I'm just like, okay, what is this? Is this like a metro station or a public toilet or a combination of the two? A lot of the time it is urine because frankly, I mean, that's another weird thing that you like the number of people I've seen just urinating in public here uh, is like way more than anywhere else I've ever seen. But yeah. to be fair, that's usually sort of drunk homeless people who are just like peeing in a you know, on the side of the street outside of outside of primary school. Um, but um, and then like you get onto the platform, there's just like a nondescript crowd of people. No, you know, no one knows where the doors are going to arrive. So people are just crowded on the platform. The doors come, the, the train comes, the doors open, and people try and get on the train while other people are getting off. And so mm. there's like a bit of a struggle. The people sort of have to kind of fight their way off the train a little bit. Everyone's in a huff. And then they get in the train and no one moves down inside the train. Everyone just squeezes into this little space in the middle, even though there is space next to where the seats are. So no one's like thinking in that Japanese way of of trying to be part of a bigger system. Um, so that's just a microcosm. That's just the the metro. But for Japanese people arriving into this totally different system with totally different rules, that it's totally at odds with the way that they are used to, it actually could be very destabilizing. Um, and add that to a sort of general feeling of unfriendliness um, that you might get from customer service if you expect the Japanese service. If you're expecting yeah. that kind of thing as a normal baseline, then you're going to be definitely shocked by the kind of thing I mentioned before, which is that often the response that you're going to get is is no. You know, you're going to get a lot of no and you have to sort of like negotiate your way through. Um, so that might account for that severe form of culture shock, that it's a combination of the expectation versus the reality being so different to just a normal baseline of behavior in, in Japan. Not everyone, not every yeah. Japanese person gets that, of course. I know Japanese people who come here and just have a fantastic time, but still it is a it is a genuine a genuine phenomenon i was thinking as you were as you were telling that story i was thinking about I, i've been to japan once and found everyone in japan to be so incredibly helpful and um the the best sort of example i think of this was um i, I was there on holiday with my my now wife and we were not in any rush at all uh and we were trying to, I think we were getting a train back from a kind of area around Mount Fuji to Tokyo. Mm. And I didn't I didn't know which platform we needed to, to stand on to get this train. And I kind of asked someone who was very helpful and kind of took me to, and said like, oh, I'm actually going on that, um, I'm going there. And kind of took me to the platform and then the train came. And then when they got on the train, she realized that she put us on the wrong train going the other way. And uh -huh. when, when the, uh, the kind of the, the, um, announcer, I guess, kind of said, this is the train going the other way. And it was like an hour to the next stop or something. <laughs> she just looked so mortified. And it was, uh, and she was, came up and was like, so incredibly sorry. And I tried to say to her, look, it really doesn't matter. We're on holiday. It's fine. <laughs> I know you tried. And the whole time she kind of came and she apologized like three or four times during the, <laughs> while we waited for the next, uh, for the train to stop so we could go back the other way. But it was, it was almost as if she was apologizing for, you know, slaughtering my entire family or doing, kind of wronging me in the most terrible way. And to think about that compared to some of the attitudes that you've talked about, uh, the Parisian attitudes that sometimes people face in terms of helpfulness. I can understand why yeah, that Paris syndrome is something that particularly affects people from Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if if a, if a Parisian person would put you on the wrong train and then just refuse to apologise. They, <laughs> they would be, a, a, of course, they'd be apologetic too. But yeah, not to the same degree that a Japanese yeah. person would, would do that. You know, where they they literally, or they're almost like, uh, you know, you know, on the ground in front of you. Um, you know, making it a, like a huge official apology sort of thing. Uh, there isn't the same culture of apologizing. But 
you know, I don't, again, I don't want to give the wrong impression. You know, you meet people in France when I, I generally, when I meet people on an individual basis, everyone's just great and lovely and really cool. Uh, but then as a whole, en masse, it's it, people just behave differently. I don't really understand why or how that happens. What, how is it that, you know, a, a nationality or a culture of people tend to have a sort of prevailing set of behaviors in certain scenarios, even though if you take them out and individually speak to them about it, they're aware and even don't agree with the way things are done. But then when they become part of a bigger system, that overall system always seems to behave in a certain a certain manner. Um, it's it's very interesting, and uh, you know, it need to be an expert in psychology to understand why that happens. Mm. Mm. I'm sure there's probably um, maybe French people watching or people from from who are not from the UK who are kind of listening to what we're saying and thinking. I can think of a hundred examples of British people doing exactly the same kind of things that there's kind of prevailing as that British people on an individual level behave in a particular way, but British society or British people overall behave differently. And oh, yeah. I guess sometimes it, yeah, sometimes it does take an outsider to see these kind of things that we're, we're not aware of. Yeah. I mean, of course we are just as ridiculous as anyone really. I mean, you just, you know, look at a Friday night in the center of any town um, and yeah. there it is, it's all on display. Like just everyone just drinking too much not eating their dinner, like after work, they just skip dinner, go straight to the pub, just drink. And then at 12 o'clock midnight, everyone's just like all over the place. Like the way people behave, just so yeah. badly drunk and just so debauched and just, it's just unbelievable. And the girls, you know, are out in skimpy dresses and not wearing coats, even though it's freezing cold. People don't, you know, like French people, or I guess Italian people will look at that and just that won't understand what the hell's going yeah. on there um and uh, then going to their accommodation uh, in the bathroom they notice that there are two taps uh in the bathroom which is a thing that completely uh, mystifies a lot of visitors to the uk it's like wait there's a a, a a hot tap on the left and a cold tap on the right why don't you just have yeah. one tap to combine the two instead it's like what how what am i supposed to do here i'm either going to completely scold my hands or my hands are going to freeze to death it's it's like two extremes um and you know that's that's right actually why do why do we have two separate taps and even even new bathrooms people will fit a new bathroom and they'll get two taps fitted even when the combination tap was an option they're still choosing the two tap yeah. option and lots of other lots of other mysterious things of that kind of nature that you know so yeah it's it works in every direction it's just humans we're just weird I think yeah, the two taps is just objectively worse than one tap. If you if you wanted to get a decent temperature, you have to fill the entire fill the entire basin and then sort of splash around. It's clearly it's just stupid. Or do do things that that we don't even realise that we don't even realise are strange. Like when I was a kid in our bathroom, we had two taps, and I never thought about it. I just always used to do the same thing, which was turn on the hot tap when I wanted to wash my hands and face, turn on the hot tap and start washing my hands in the water and washing my face. And by the time it came to like rinse my hands and face, the water was warm. So I would do that and stop before the water got too hot. And so I'd, I'd basically start with the cold water. By the time I'm rinsing my face off, the water's a good temperature, but I'd learned to time it right so that I never used boiling hot water. And that was just normal. And that and that just sort of relies on your boiler not working, not kind of pumping out hot water very quickly, which yeah, is- exactly. Is, and, if you, yeah. and if you've got an efficient <laughs> yeah. boiler, you have to kind of flip your hands like this to, to not get scalded by the, by the hot water. Or you do this kind of thing where you're skipping between the two, like a bit of hot water, a bit in, to the cold tap for, you know, getting the mix right in your hands, or you fill up the basin, which is actually, yeah, that's the that's the way to do it. You fill the basin, but then people say, "But that's unhygienic because the basin might be a bit dirty." Yeah, so fair enough. Yeah, everyone else is right, and we're wrong when it comes to two tap. <laughs> you know, I can't defend that. Um, no. Yeah. Me neither. Well, let's. Um, I, I know we've been talking for a while. Should we talk briefly about your the comedy uh, that you do? Because for anyone who is not aware, uh, Luke is also a um, a. I can't say a world-renowned stand-up comic. I'll say that. Oh, anyway. 
Uh, I don't know. No, I'm not a world-renowned Paris stand-up. Renowned stand-up comic. Uh, <laughs> I don't know really. So yeah, I do stand up here, but um, I'm a little bit under the radar with stand-up comedy because the thing that I'm most known for is doing a podcast. Although I don't get that many listeners in France. It's a bit weird, my life, because online I'm kind of quite well known among, you know, to a certain extent in every country in the world. Like I'm not famous. I'm definitely not famous. I can't go to countries and be famous. But but then if you got all my listeners together, there's like tons of them. So it's I'm kind of unknown country. and yet famous at the same time. It's very weird. So um, uh, what was I saying? So anyway, I do my, my, the podcast is the main thing I do, but I also do stand up. And um, uh, I guess the biggest audiences I perform to are when I do a show with my friend Paul, who um, is a professional stand up comedian. So he's English and speaks French really well. He's bilingual and he does stand up in both. And we both started doing we both came to we both we were both doing stand up together at the same time in the early days that's how we know each other but he gave up his job and and went for decided to do stand up full time both in french and english and now he's like really successful um and does like tours of the country and tours of the french speaking world and had a show on tv and stuff like that so if I, the biggest shows I do are often supporting him or shows that he's organized. For example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he did a show at a, a venue in Paris in front of uh, 4,200 people. And um, I was one of his opening acts. So I managed, I got to do uh, 10 minutes in front of 4,200 people, a sold out show at this big venue. Um, and so, you know, that's wonderful. But other times, normally, I'll be doing shows in front of about, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, sometimes less. So the, the, the show before that big show I did, uh, I performed to four people. So I went from four people at one show to 4,200 people at the next show, which was just like, you know, times what, uh, it by a thousand. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, what... It, for which one were you more nervous? Because I can imagine sort of 4,200, there's so many people you can't really, you just sort of have to get on with it. Whereas four people, maybe you're looking at each individual one and thinking, why didn't that person laugh at that joke or uh, that person's looking at their phone or that kind of thing? In fact, weirdly enough, I was more nervous for the four people because the thing about the 4,200 people is that I knew exactly what I was going to do. And I knew I was going to do my tried and tested material, which I know well. And I know works. So it was just a question of, right, I'm just going to go up and, in, and enjoy doing this. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be fine. But with the four people, so uh, I, I sat there at the back of the room watching all my all the other comedians go up and just die. Because there's, you know, you can't really succeed in front of four people. I mean, you just get one mm. person to chuckle and you're, you're, you're killing the room. You know, uh, I mean, you're doing well. But when even when one person chuckles, you don't hear it, you don't feel it. Like what you want as a comedian is, you know, a fairly good room and you feel the laughter, you know, it, it impacts you. Not, not just, not the sound waves, but like, you know, there's enough volume that you, it, it, you, you kind of surf, you surf on the laughs sort of thing, if you know what I mean. Hmm. And when you've got an audience of four, four and a half thousand people, you can really surf a lot, you know, um, but when there's only four people, you know, little tiny waves, there's nothing, you can't surf on those waves. So you're just, you're just falling in the water every single time. Sort of drops of water and kind of, oh, and that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of the time it's just super awkward because you're literally standing there in front of four people who don't even want to look you in the eye because they, they can't escape. You know, there's the, the anonymity of a crowd is a wonderful thing at a comedy show because it gives people the, 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 uh, it makes people feel relaxed enough to just laugh and, and be themselves and stuff. But when there's only four people in the audience and you're like, you know, talking to this person, then talking to that person, they can start to feel uncomfortable, especially, especially if you're not making everyone laugh. So yeah, I was more nervous about the four people because I thought oh, I'm just going to go up and die on my ass in front of four people. And it's going to be really awkward. Plus I was trying to do new stuff as well. And when, whenever you're doing new things, you don't, you never know really how it's going to go. So yeah, the four people was more, was, was more nerve wracking, strangely enough. And four four 4.2 thousand was just really fun. Um, 
but yeah, so doing stand up in France, yes, the audiences, um, naturally, a lot of people in the audiences are are French, of course, um, uh, people who who have varying degrees of English, but then typically at my shows, and I, I'm doing this in English, typically at the shows as well, you get a certain number of um, English speakers too, so that could be um, like expats. Uh, people who just you know from the UK or Australia or America or whatever, and they just live in in Paris and they come to a show in English, or you get tourists who are just passing through and they see that there's a show in English and they they join in. So, you know, the the, the audience will be a, a combination of those things, like local pe- local French people um, with varying degrees of English, expats who know who understand everything you're saying, and then tourists who probably speak pretty good English but might not as well. Um, so that's an odd, it can be an odd audience to perform to. Um, hmm. and, and the your sort of, your corpus of material, I guess the, the kind of the things that you're talking about generally, is it similar kind of stuff to the kind of things we've been talking about today in terms of looking at those peculiarities of British culture, French culture, that kind of stuff? Yes. Um, now, what I've discovered is that Often I want to talk about other things, you know, I want to kind of talk about other other stuff, whatever it is, you know, and not about the cultural differences and things. But uh, what I've discovered works and what I can be certain about um, is that especially when there's a lot of French people in the audience that you have to talk about them and you have to talk about France and French culture or Paris. Um, they're quite willing to hear you talk about to make fun of British culture too. But it has to be that stuff. It has to be the cultural things. I say it has to be. It doesn't have to be. But that is what works the best, especially for a French crowd. They want it. They want to come and see a British person making jokes about them. You know, they they want. They really want that. And if you start talking about other things, you can you get the sense that they their attention. You kind of lose their attention a little bit. Like they're just not interested. Like basically, your role is to be there to comment on their stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. And once you accept that, then, you know, that's, then you have to do that. Now there's potentially things can get a bit cliched when you do that, you know, like, Hey, French people are like this. English people are like this. It can be a bit of a drag to, to end up dealing in cliches, but if you can find an original way to pinpoint things, then, then that really, really works. And so, yeah, often it's, it's talking about the same things we've talked about, but in stand up, you have to, you have to be very, very, very specific and very, very precise. And um, um, a lot of it's about telling stories. And um, so really, it's a question of trying your best to put your finger on a cultural or behavioral um, thing, like the way that Parisians do things. You've got to put your finger on it in a very specific way and put it in the form of a story with jokes you know with structures um that that inc- essentially include setups and punchlines and, and mm. things like that um so yeah it's a question of finding ways of doing that and, and like recently uh, in in paris they've got the olympics coming uh, in 2024 this year and so i've been doing a lot of stuff about the olympics and and my way of dealing with that is to basically talk about how Paris needs to introduce some new Olympic events, uh, which uh, will yeah. give them a chance to win. And that's, you know, a pretty useful device for then pinpointing sort of typical Parisian behavior and then presenting that behavior in the form of different Olympic events, you know, and, and that's, can you, can you, you know, share, do you want to share one or two? I, I know that, uh, um, uh, I know that for the full experience, people should be uh, coming to a show. But can you can you share one, uh, yeah, one example of a a Parisian Olympic event that should exist? So one of them is the Q jump, of course, <laughs> right? Jumping the yeah. jumping the queue, um, jumping the line at the supermarket, and then I usually say because you know British people would we'd be terrible at that because we'd come last, you know, no medals for us because we'd just be like, oh, sorry, sorry, excuse me, sorry, sorry, and. In stand up, what I can do there is there's a physical movement where I'm just like backing away, you know, backing, yeah, you know, yeah. going backwards. And, you know, that's another thing maybe I've noticed about doing stand up in France is that there's you've got to emphasize a lot of more visual humor. I think f- 
French audiences, for whatever reason, respond quite a lot to a bit more clowning and you end up having to do a bit more physical stuff. That obviously works as well for audiences that don't have English as a first language. Emphasizing some physical movement is, you know, physical physical stuff is a universal language that, that everyone can get. This is the tricky thing about comedy, that in order to get it, you've got to understand it instantly. And so that can be a challenge when you're doing comedy to people who don't speak English as a first language. If your language, if you play with the language too much, then you lose them and they don't get that instant reaction that is necessary. So anyway, uh, British people, we would be bad at this because we just start, sorry, oh, sorry, 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 going backwards. Um, whereas the French, you know, obviously you're going to get a gold medal here. And I, I was, I did that again. I did that quite a lot of times. And only recently I developed a way to make that work in front of an audience. And it was to get more specific. And I've worked out that the, the, the key to getting a laugh for that is to say the only way to, to get a gold medal in this event is if you get caught jumping the queue and then you uh, pretend that you don't understand the rules of the system. And, um, and then I do this sort of like body language of like this and a Parisian audience always laughs at that because they understand that that's actually what's going on, that people jump the yeah. queue and they've got this pretense that they just have misunderstood something. It's always the thing. If, if you, if you say, Oh, I'm next, either they will get in your face about it, which happened to me once, or they will just pretend like they didn't even realize, Oh yeah, you didn't see this queue of people here, you know, like, Oh, I just thought that I didn't realize, you know, so that's the key to it. Like the, to win the medal, to win the gold, you've got to, you know, do this specific thing. You've got to act like you don't understand the rules of the system while making the noise of a sheep. Bah, bah. Because that's the thing that French people do. They say bah. Like the way in, in English we say, um, in French it's bah. So there's that, there's the cue jump. And then there's uh, other things, even pétanque. Um, because, you know, France, France is the best and only country in the world to play this sport if it is even a sport as far as i can tell it's just a bunch of people standing around dropping things you know um and you know other other stuff of that nature i don't know what your audience is going to think of that they're like oh, this is not very funny but it when you're in front of 4200 people that absolutely works every time comedy gold everyone I I guess also 4,000 people who understand what bedonk is, which I am, I would imagine some people watching this might not know what that is. Good point. Yeah. So petonk is, there, is a, is it's a very French thing indeed. And it's actually great, um, to be fair. Um, and it's, it's, it's a kind of lovely, relaxing sport, not sport, activity, I don't know, game that you, a lot of people play in the street or not necessarily in the street, but outside. And in a typical French town, every town has got an area often in the center of the, the town, uh, an area that's that's designed to be used for playing pétanque. And essentially, um, it involves throwing metal, heavy metal balls. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's one wooden ball which gets thrown first, and then you have to throw the metal balls uh, and have them uh, land as close to that wooden ball as possible. The closer you are, the better. And, you know, that's it kind of a bit like darts sort of but throwing metal balls on the floor and you can spend a nice sunday afternoon doing that drinking a glass of red wine smoking a cigar in you know in the center of town and you know every day there's people playing petanque up and down the country and being very french happens all the time yeah um, yeah, I think it's probably hard to think of a more French activity than than playing pétanque. There's probably, there's, probably there's, there's a few going uh, on strike, going on strike, uh, Alistair. Going on strike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was I, when you were talking about when you were talking earlier. I was thinking about multiple times. I went to I did an Erasmus exchange in uh, the University of Lyon, and I reckon more than fifty percent of the time that I went to a particular. Uh, particular class, the teacher was just on strike and there was just a no notice outside. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. I've, 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 uh, I've kept you for a very long time, but there's one more question that I uh, really want to ask you. And that I think is, I, I've kind of, 
I've got a sense of what the answer could be. Um, but how, so you've been in, in Paris for 10 years, you said now. Uh, and I guess Paris is Paris is home. You have a French wife and two, two French kids. How has living in France slash Paris kind of changed you, do you think, as a, as a person? And how is that also, it's a kind of dual question. Do you feel like more or less British given how long you've been living in France? Oh, that's, really, that's a really good question. So how has it changed me? Um, hmm, well, actually, it's really hard to tell because I can't really, can't really tell so much. I'm sure it must have changed me somehow. It's really hard to know. So I'll, I'll put that question to one side and consider whether I'm any more or less British than I was before. In some ways, I feel weirdly even more British because when you come out of your home country and go somewhere else, you become f much more aware of, of you know, your, your identity. And certainly in the first few years, I realized that I was like much more proudly British and proud about certain British things that normally I just wasn't proud about before. So like, for example, I don't know, so even like things I shouldn't be proud of, like I'd hear French people talking about crime in Paris. And I'd be like, oh, you don't know what we I'm from London, we've got proper crime in London, you know, like stabbing capital of Europe in London, you know, like feel all proud that like people keep getting stabbed. Um, <laughs> and also kind of gravitating towards certain like products that I wouldn't normally uh, use. For example, in the supermarket, there sometimes there's a little section where they have like foreign products and you might find, you know, Coleman's English mustard, which to be fair, even in England, I was, I would definitely eat all the time. And then like Worcester sauce. And I remember once I saw Worcester sauce on the shelf, I was like, oh, Worcester sauce, I've got to buy some Worcester sauce. Like never, ever used it in cooking when I lived in England, ever. You know, I just never used Worcester sauce. But I saw Worcester sauce and Marmite. And I was like, oh, I've got to get Marmite and Worcester sauce. And now I'm like using Worcester sauce in everything I cook. I've never used it yeah. before. Um, <laughs> um, on your cereal. Yeah, just like Worcester sauce and everything. Worcester sauce in my tea. Worcester sauce and Marmite and, you know. Um, so yeah, you kind of like become weirdly proud of certain British things, but then that's worn off as well. And oh, I don't know. I don't really know, Alistair. It's, it's really hard to tell. Um, mm, I think I'm probably pretty much the same because I'm, I moved here. I moved here when I was, uh, you know, in my late thirties. And, um, I think by the time you get to that age, it's just like, right, that's it. I'm done now. You know, <laughs> no changing. No, I'm just, that's it. I'm, I'm finished now. I'm just going to stay that's like me. this forever. Yeah. <laughs> maybe a bit, maybe a bit more Marmite and Worcester sauce, but, uh, but I think but basically, I'm done. yeah, sorry. No, it's not put as super <laughs> uh, I, I ask as my, um, yeah, my, my mum's sister moved to France, I think when she was 19 or so. And, you know, she's now 59 or something. Um, so uh, it's always fun to hear my mum talking about how her sister has sort of, you know, become more or less British, um, more or less French. And someone like that is in this peculiar limbo, I guess, where you've, you have a, a childhood in one country, but the majority of your life in a country that's, you know, not your country by birth, um, but it's your kind of adopted country. And you have this you sort of vision of what life in the UK was like from in her case 40 years ago yeah um and you also have spent most of your life living kind of like a, as a semi-outsider but also in that in a, in a society sort of kind of looking uh looking inward i guess um so it's, it's always interesting to hear someone's perspective on that i think i'm probably a bit more like that a bit living in limbo because you know in france i still as i said at the beginning still feel like an outsider i don't feel like i've really become french um, you know, so I still definitely see France from a sort of outsider's point of view. But then when I go back to the Britain, although I definitely do feel at home and I just love like going into a pub and going up to the bar and just ordering a pint of beer and a packet of crisps and just like being very English, it just like comes so naturally to me. 
also though when i'm in the uk i can't help looking at it from a from a, from an outside perspective but to be fair like i had that already quite early on after moving away in my early 20s and living living abroad for a couple of years so i I'd, I'd already had that experience of being pushed outside of um my small world of you know britishness and and like having a very different experience living in japan and then it was really obvious when i came back from japan after two years of like feeling totally out of place in my own country and um so i'd already had that experience so i think coming to france and then living in a limbo between france and britain it's just like the new normal for me and also i feel like i feel like these days um, you know, with the globalization of the internet and all that stuff, I think that maybe the the lines are a bit more blurred anyway. Um, so yeah, it doesn't strike me so so much these days. Um, of, of I don't get that culture shock, that reverse culture shock, when I go back to the UK. Not as much as I used to when I came back from Japan, where it was suddenly like, oh my god, what is this place? Um, mm. I guess also given that it's, you know, 26 miles across the channel, you're able to go back a bit more frequently. Yeah, that's right. I think maybe if I didn't go back very, very often, then when I did return, it would be a bit more striking, the difference. But since I'm going back every every few months, really, um, yeah, I'm kind of like used to it. So I operate in both and sort of see see both of them um, fairly, fairly regularly. So it's 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 not that there isn't that much culture shock now. So, you know, yeah. you're not shocked to go back and find that the price of a pret sandwich is, is now almost £10 or something like that. No, that's always shocking. Like the inflation and the cost of stuff. Yeah, it's, and like like accommodation. You know, if we try and book a holiday in, in England, you know, like on the South Coast or something, it's just it's like shocking. The, the price and versus the quality of the accommodation so yeah, maybe I have become a bit French, where I'm kind of like, my standards are slightly higher than they than they might otherwise have been. Standards in terms of accommodation, because you know I think I think in in France and probably other European countries, the the standards or expectations are slightly higher. For example, homes in the UK they're often a bit drafty, right? They're often a bit drafty, and especially like old-fashioned houses in London with those Victorian sash windows, those old-fashioned, lovely sash windows with, yeah, the ones that go up and slide up and down. They've got weights, lead weights on the inside of the frame and everything. Those are very, very desirable windows, you know, original Victorian ones, but they are, but they are drafty. They let drafts in and British people just like live with drafts. You know, we just put a pair of slippers on, cup of tea, and just like we have drafts in our homes. Whereas if you come from, I don't know, Germany or Italy or France or something, and you, you go and live in an English home for a, year, for a year, you'll be like shocked by how e the lack of energy efficiency or the how cold it can be. Um, and and, and uh, so maybe I've become a bit soft in that way. And I feel the cold a little bit more. And I'm, I, I expect, um, you know, to, there to be no drafts in the in you know coming from the windows and um you know i expect those european levels of window design and things like that and and stuff yeah i've got a good italian friend who lives in london and um when he first arrived he had the same kind of culture shock like why is everyone living with these ridiculous windows and he had this sort of grand vision of becoming a kind of window multimillionaire, <laughs> thinking like all i'm going to do is import Italian windows to the UK and there are whatever whatever the, the market is, like 40 million houses and every single one of them will need my windows. And um, I think he hadn't, uh, he hadn't properly taken into consideration probably the, the cultural element that us Brits are actually, you know, okay with this. It's not some kind of grand national concern. Anyway, the, the windows there gets kind of yeah, it's a funny thing that Brits tend to tend to live with. Well, we we um, weirdly we will tolerate living with a certain level of discomfort, as if like we don't you know as if it's something there's something maybe a bit wrong about 
expecting everything to be comfortable. Like we, we, we will live with a level of discomfort. It's a certain kind of stoic uh, Englishness or Britishness, isn't it? Um, you know, uh, I, I like uh, like not wearing too many clothes when you go on a night out. Huh? Yeah, like if you're in yeah if you're in the north of England going out and you don't wear a jacket because it's if you're wearing a jacket you're soft, you know, so you've got to be tough, and um, so you know the, yeah there's a certain stoic toughness <laughs> that um, we perhaps hold on to. So your Italian friend, sorry, this is why we voted Brexit apparently, so that people like him can't come in and make millions selling us good quality windows. We don't want your good windows. We don't want your comfort. We don't want your level of comfort. This is Britain, for goodness sake. Yeah, we're, we're very happy with our drafts. Uh, anyway, Luke, I think we should probably wrap things yeah. up here because I know I've taken up a lot of your time and we've heard some absolutely wonderful stories. I guess I'd normally say, do you want to tell people where they can find out more about Luke and Luke's English podcast? But uh, I imagine most people have heard of it already. So let's talk about the 1% of people who've not heard of Luke's English podcast. Why don't you tell people where they can find out more about you and your podcast? So, yeah, the podcast, it's an audio podcast, which I guess most people know about, although a lot of people actually surprisingly don't know what, what a podcast is or how to say it or spell it. But anyway, uh, the audio, there's the audio podcast and then it's also a YouTube channel as well. And it's more or less the same content. So the audio podcast, it's called Luke's English Podcast, which I worked very hard to, you know, really worked hard to come up with that name 15 years ago. Um, Luke's English Podcast, L-U-K-E apostrophe S, English Podcast, uh, which you just search your podcast player and you'll find it. Um, and on YouTube, same thing, Luke's English Podcast on YouTube. Uh, but the, the, the place you can go to get everything is basically my website, which is teacherluke.co.uk, uh, teacherluke.co.uk. I discovered recently, Alistair, that there are a grand total of two other Teacher Lukes out there. Who are these imposters, these other teacher Lukes? One of them, I think, is a Welsh guy, I think, who does IELTS training, and he's on the Instagram. And then there's another guy, an American uh, English teacher, who, who went to, I think, Vietnam, and he ended up in prison. Uh, so I just want to, you know, uh, it's, <laughs> it's very unfortunate. There are these other teacher Lukes kind of like, um, um, you know, uh, muscling in on my territory. But I'm the original Teacher Luke. But anyway, teacherluke.co.uk is my website. That's where you can kind of like find out everything if you want to listen to my episodes and, and look, check out my episode archive, including um, an episode with you as well from last year. Indeed. Yes, there you go. And uh, you'll find, what do we say, almost 63 days of continuous listening um, and including the premium episodes, there was however many more days. So lots to catch up on if people have not yet started uh, okay well with that i will say thank you so much for your time luke and yeah it's been a pleasure thank you for inviting me onto your show uh, it's been fun to talk about this stuff and listeners um i hope that you've uh, you know i hope that you understand the things i've i've been trying to explain and i'm i don't know if you've got comment sections and stuff where people can write their comments but uh yeah, I'm very curious to to read some of the comments just to see what people think and if I've got French listeners or or you know, whatever just you know, let us know your your insights there as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll put this on YouTube as well. Let us know in the comments um uh, your funniest French anecdotes all that kind of stuff. Mm, sure. Like and subscribe everyone. Uh, like and subscribe as well. Uh, there we go. Okay, thank you so much for your time Luke and uh, we'll chat again in the future. Indeed. All right. Thanks, Alistair. Bye, everyone.